Thank you, Pastor Zorn, for allowing us to be here tonight and for taking care of this group. Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Hoover, for everything, the invitation to be a part of this. It's been very good. I assume you didn't make it to Kings Mountain. Everything went well over there. Uh, you only lost three. And, uh, you know that the commander there of the British forces, Patrick Ferguson, said that God could move him off that mountain. And well, God decided to leave him there. It just <laughs> buried him. Uh, and shouldn't make such statements as, as that unless it's what the Bible says God can't or won't do. But I'm glad you got the, the privilege of going there. I can remember sitting in that theater at Kings Mountain and the video that was put together, nothing about God or his intervention in that battle, that struggle. And that's the way it is in all of the government-sponsored national parks Come around this country today. Right. They've taken right. God out. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate you young people, especially, yes. wanting to learn that, that God does work in the affairs of men. Amen. I can remember being in a motel room, you know what that's like, preacher, and watching the British History Channel, and they're talking about the Battle of Kings Mountain. And they said that when the colonists attacked, now, there were so many people that came down out of the mountains that they had to leave half of them behind. Camp just a few miles from where the struggle is, there are too many. And so uh, they took half of their forces, went over there, and the British History Channel said it accurately, that when they attacked, their battle cry was the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. How about that? They went in the name of the Lord. And uh, it's a blessing. And uh, neither one of them told that the number of Baptist preachers, and especially the Baptist preacher George McNeil, was at the foot of the mountain praying all the time that God would give the Americans wow. the victory. And God did. And if, if it's worth a fleshly struggle, it's worth us praying about it. Right. And we learned that from uh, our heritage uh, just a little bit. And I'm just going to give you a few uh, Baptist history stories. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Yeah. And uh, the Bible tells us to continue in those things. We see that. You see it here in your own congregation. You see it there in the congregations that are represented on those who are on this trip. Uh, we see it. Here's your little Michigan Baptist history. A man by the name of J.S.C.F. Fry. Joseph Samuel Christian Frederick Fry. Uh, he was from, uh, he's a Jew from uh, London. And uh, he fell under the preaching of the gospel. And he got saved. Now, when you do that as a Jew, you lose a lot. Uh, you, you gain more than you lose. I understand that. But uh, your family will turn against you. Uh, Fry uh, wanted to please the Lord, and he began to preach, and he began to try and witness to Jews and uh, bring others to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he was successful in that attempt. But he's laboring one day, and one of his fellow laborers asked him about baptism. Now, what about believer's baptism, preacher? Well, it doesn't matter to me. All of my children are past the age of baptism, and uh, so I don't have to think about that now. He said, oh, but the scripture talks about believer's baptism after you're safe. And for I flippantly said, well, uh, if I have another child, maybe I'll think about it, but we're done. He had a large family. And... Uh, <laughs> Probably shouldn't make statements like that, but uh, anyway, his wife did become with child again. And true to his word, he examined the scripture and realized that he was wrong. The Bible does teach believers baptism Amen. only, yes, and that sir. by immersion. And so uh, Joseph Samuel Christian Frederick Fry, uh, he followed the Lord in believers baptism and became a Baptist preacher. In fact, uh, whenever he got saved, uh, to show his Christian heritage, he, he added those names Christian Frederick. I mean, he wanted people not only to hear his Jewish name, but his Christian name. And he came to America. He labored there in uh, New York City, 
He started the American Society for the Amelioration of the Jews. The Jews that would come to this country, they could find rest, and he would help them to be integrated into the American states. He'd give them what they needed and help them, and he had adversaries. Henry Ford, at the same time, uh, he started a society in New York City to help Muslims come into this country. And uh, you wonder why that Dearborn, Michigan has so many Muslims because of Henry Ford and his love for them and his hatred for the Jews. But Joseph Fry, he continued to labor. He wrote a set of books on types found in scripture. It's probably the finest uh, work on that subject that is in existence. And uh, he finally moved to Michigan. He died there in Pontiac and is buried in that place. And so if you haven't been there yet, You've got another story and got another place to go, and there are many of them. But uh, we sang tonight. Wasn't the singing good? Amen. We enjoyed it. Amen. But you know, there was a time in Baptist history when Baptists had ceased to sing. Didn't sing in their churches at all. Why? Because they had also been hunted, imprisoned, fined, beaten, put to death. And so they quit singing because they didn't want the authorities to learn where they were meeting. And there was a Baptist preacher by the name of Benjamin Keach who said, that's wrong. We need to sing. Amen. Keach wrote a book on the subject and it was called A Breach in God's Worship Repaired. He took them to Ephesians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 3, and he showed that the scripture teaches that we must sing. And we ought to correct this problem in our churches. Amen. And so Keach, who is known as the father of English Baptist hymnody, he began to write hymns. And he introduced one to his congregation. And that Lord's Day, the first time in England that Baptist started to sing hymns again, the church split right down the middle. Huh. Half of them stayed we agree with what the scripture says. The other half said, we've not done it that way before and we're not going to do it now. And so <clears throat> that's happened in a lot of Baptist right, churches over right, the years. Yes, but uh, Keach continued, continued to write hymns and they continued to sing. They sang one hymn per month for five years. Now, not one every, every time they got together, just one Per month for five years. The second five years, he added another. They're singing two. And uh, by the end of 20 years, this is how slowly they proceeded, how long it took. By the end of 20 years, they're singing one hymn every Lord's Day in Keech's church there in England. And gradually it caught on again. Baptists realized we must sing. There have been so many Baptist hymn writers that have labored over the years to uh, give us the songs that we sing. Keach was arrested for his writing. He wrote over 40 books, and there are a few of them that are still in print, most of them not. The Baptist History Preservation Society, we find those first editions if we can. We've got seven of Keach first editions in our collection, and you're welcome to bring the group by the Baptist History Archives at the moment, it's in Knoxville, Tennessee, and we hope uh, we've got a five-year uh, five plan now to build the Baptist History Archives and Museum uh, right here about three miles down the road. And so we it's want you to come and see and visit yeah, whenever it's available to, uh, to the public because our heritage needs to yes, be sir. made known. Because Keach was a writer and he wrote a book for children to teach them how to read using scripture. He was arrested for it. And they said, you can't write that book. Well, I'm just teaching children how to read. Doesn't matter, you're a Baptist. You cannot write. And so they sentenced him to be put in the stocks there in Winslow, England, where his meeting house was. And that was to be on the city square. He was to have his accusation pasted to his forehead and his books piled in a pile in front of him and burned. And that's what happened. And on that occasion, when people were put in the stocks, uh, folks would reproach them. 
yell all kinds of insults. They would come by and slap them on the face or spit upon them or pelt them with stones or other objects. But on that occasion, that Baptist preacher had such a testimony, none of that happened. In fact, the authorities couldn't believe it. He's in the stocks. And the people who were not Baptist for the most part asked the preacher, would he preach to them? And so he's able to wiggle one of his hands out of the stocks, reach into his pocket, pull out his New Testament, open it, and preach to that crowd that was together. Wouldn't you like to see that? Uh, Benjamin Keach for singing. We owe him a great debt of gratitude as Baptist. And now there are other hymn writers who are not Baptist. We sing their songs. Uh, John Newton. Amazing Grace. And by the way, he wrote a lot more than Amazing right. Grace, and most of what he wrote is better than Amazing Grace. Uh, it, it really is something. But I remember being in Olney, England, and uh, that's where John Newton, the former uh, slaver, was pastoring. And I'm standing against a building as I'm looking across the village green, and I can see the spire of the congregational church which Newton pastored. And I went over and saw his grave. He's buried there in that churchyard. And then I could look across the village green, and there's the William Cooper uh, Museum and House. And uh, William Cooper, uh, he was in an insane asylum there in England. He tried 17 times to take his life. He had no hope as far as he knew, but one day there in that asylum, someone had left a, a copy of the Word of God open on a table. He sat down beside of it. It was open to Romans chapter 3. He read there in Romans chapter 3 about the blood of Jesus Christ and how it cleanses and how it justifies. And he asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save him. He got out of that insane asylum and he began to write hymns. You know that one he wrote to commemorate that occasion. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunge be congregation sing, but there in the home of William Cooper is where he and John Newton worked together to release the only hymns. And uh, you can still see the path that goes out the back of the Cooper home uh, through the gate over to uh, the home where John Newton lived. And uh, it's amazing to think that there in one town you've got those two, two hymn writers. Yeah. And by the way, we don't just sing hymns written by Baptist. Here's something that's unique about a Baptist people. Now, there have been a lot of hymns excluded from Protestant hymnals because they were written by Baptists. They were written about the blood of Christ and other right doctrine. We sing what we sing because it's scriptural. That's why we do everything that we do. At least it should be as a Baptist. And uh, I'm thinking, what a great place and how God worked. Oh, but it gets better there in that town of Olney. For you see, I'm standing with my back against the Sutcliffe Memorial Baptist Church. John Sutcliffe was the founding pastor. And you say, "I I haven't heard his name. It's not necessary. The Lord knows. But here's how God used him. This is all in one town. John Sutcliffe was preaching there in Olney when a young man by the name of William Carey believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Carrier, the missionary who went out to India, and God used him to translate the scripture into many dialects, and uh, many people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior in one town. Folks, God is able to do that again. Young people, uh, he can do that in your town if you'll be obedient to him. I don't know what gifts he'll give you to labor together, but 
I know that he uses it. And it could be said of your town in the future. Someone could be here talking if Jesus hasn't come first and say, here's what God did in this place. And uh, that's the way it should be. It really should. Uh, there are others, old preachers, uh, there in Wales. Henry Williams, the old Baptist preacher in the 1600s, he preached and was persecuted for it. On one occasion, the authorities came. They carried away his family. They beat him. They burned his home, all of his outbuildings, and all of his crops in the field. They destroyed them all, at least all that they found. There was one field, one field. Now, Hollywood can't ever get it right. <laughs> there is no plot in any movie that doesn't come straight from King James Bible. Right. Uh, Not a one. That's right. And so the field of dreams, you build it and they will come. Why, there in Wales in that time, if you were a Baptist preacher, uh, if you had anything, the authorities would come. They'd take you away and take your property away, destroy it. But they couldn't find one wheat field that Henry Williams had planted. And that year, something happened that had never happened anywhere in the history of the world as far as uh, has been recorded. It's never happened again since. But instead of there being one head on each shaft of wheat, there were seven. <laughs> seven. Oh, my. Yes. And uh, he not only with that, not only was he able to take care of his family, but he was able to sell it for enough to rebuild his home and every other thing that it had. God can do that. Yes. He can. And uh, I don't know if he'll need to do it again, but it's good for you to know that he has. That's right. Amen. And uh, you can trust him. God is so good. Williams remained faithful for the rest of his life. Another preacher in Wales, known as the greatest uh, preacher in the history of Christianity outside of the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ. His name was Christmas Evans. Evans got in a fight when he was a young man. I wouldn't want to have been in a fight with him because he was seven feet tall. He was a giant of a man. And he got in a fight with 12 of his, his friends. And he won the fight, but he lost an eye. And uh, can you imagine the spectacle of uh, that man who would stand in a pulpit and preach there in Wales? and thunder the word of God, and yet he's mostly unknown to us today. But Christmas Evans, uh, God used him, and on a, one occasion many years later, there are a group of English, uh, English people who are talking about the English Baptist and how great preachers they are, and there's one Welshman in the room. And uh, they finally look at him and say, what do you think about our great preachers? He said, you don't have any great preachers in England. They're all in Wales. And uh, what do you mean? Well, by the time you English get around to lighting the match, uh, the Welsh preachers would already burn the house down. And, uh, well, tell us about that. And he told them about Christmas Evans and uh, how he would preach and recited a, a message. So everywhere you go, in every country, Baptists have, uh, have labored. Amen. And uh, they have been faithful. Faithful. They have continued in the things which they have learned and has been assured of, knowing uh, of whom thou hast learned them. And uh, we'll leave you with this story. In 1555. Now, there have been many of your Baptist ancestors martyred. By the millions, they have been put to death. We don't know all of their names. The Lord does. But here's one we do know. His name was Thomas Hawkes. He was a Baptist preacher there in England. He was arrested, burned at the stake for his faith. And history tells us that before he was led to the place of his execution, his church members came to him and said, Preacher, if you could, uh, while you're suffering, just give us some kind of indication that uh, the Lord has sustained you, then that would help us. Now, preacher, we know you're going to die for your faith. And we understand that, but could you help us? And, uh, and it's good when the preacher can help you. But the Word of God will help you. The Amen. Spirit of God that's Amen. in you will help you. Uh, but on that occasion, Thomas Hawks was tied to the stake. The wood was piled around. And uh, he was burning. His head bowed. They thought he was gone. 
when the ropes that held his hands were burned in two. That fire had also burned all the flesh from his fingers. But he lifted his head and he clapped his hands three times above his head as he praised the Lord and he died. I'd say that was a pretty good sign to a people who should not yeah. seek signs that God had sustained him and he always did. And I said that, that was the last one, but if you'll permit me. Go ahead. Ben Go ahead. Benjamin Keach, that famous Baptist preacher who suffered for his faith, introduced, reintroduced him singing to the Baptist churches, had a son by the name of Elias. Now, in Pennsylvania, in 1688, a group of Baptists from England and Wales began to meet. Today, that church, still in existence, is known as the Pennypack Baptist Church. It is the oldest Baptist church in Pennsylvania. But they had no pastor. They heard, however, that the son of the great Baptist preacher, Benjamin Keach, had arrived there in Philadelphia. Now, they didn't know that he was running from home. They didn't know that he was unsaved. They didn't know that he left home because he wanted nothing to do with his father's God or his preaching. But they went to see him. And they asked him, if he would be their preacher. And he said, well, I can't do this. And they said, but you're Benjamin Keach's son, and we need a preacher, will you preach for us? And he thought to himself, well, I need some way to support me while I'm here, and I can preach my father's messages. I've heard them. And so he agreed, agreed to preach for him. And so that first time that he stood to preach, he's... He's doing fairly well by memory. He's preaching his father's message until he gets to about the halfway point and he just stops. He looks like a man astonished. He begins to weep uncontrollably. They say, preacher, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? And when he was able to gain his composure, he admitted to them that he was an imposter. Not only was he not a preacher, he was not a Christian. He had preached himself under conviction. Yeah. <laughs> Better than that, he, be, he became his own first convert. <laughs> he got not saved. Yeah. And uh, the Baptist, real Baptist preacher Thomas Dungan baptized him, ordained him to the gospel ministry, and he became the first pastor of the Pentapac Baptist Church. And he planted other churches. And he became an author like his father. He wrote hymns like his father. Planted churches is a blessing. We've got a wonderful heritage. Young people, I appreciate you wanting to know it. And I encourage you to continue in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I'm not going to, we're fixing to let you loose here in just a minute. I'm not going to preach a full message. But if I had to preach tonight, Brother Hoover got up and quoted 2 Timothy chapter 2. Pastor Fagger got up and quoted 2 Timothy chapter 3. And my text tonight was going to come out of 2 Timothy chapter 4. (laughs) And I just want you to turn there real fast. We're going to let you go. Esther, come to the piano and get ready to sing, I Choose to Be a Christian. There's been so much said today, and and even hearing these young people, Brother Cook, testify tonight and and from this morning, (coughs) hearing Brother Faggart talk about the fighting Baptist preacher, uh, John Cano, from there to Sandy Creek, and and then hearing you guys went to Kings Mountain where that battle took place, and many of those men being Baptists. And then hearing these young people talk and and things they've talked about. This is what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 6. He said, for I'm now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul, how did you survive all the things that you went through? The beatings, the stoning, the shipwrecks, the perilous Times that you have walked through according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. How did you, how did you survive? And it is 
these three words at the beginning of verse 7. I have fought. I, I just fought. It wasn't always easy. It wasn't always fun. Seems like, and I, I, I preached a message out of this text to our church here a few months ago on I have fought on this text. Some of you might remember it, some of you might not. But young people, um, we're living in a church society today, and I'm talking to our young people too, that, 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 that is building up Christianity as it, it's supposed to be fun. It ain't always fun. We can always have joy. There may be perilous times ahead. There is going to be perilous times ahead. There may be to it. Uh, we're living in them. And it could get darker and it could get worse. But the confidence I have is after hearing those things that Brother Fagner just got up and talked about. It's the Spirit of God that lifted those men. It's the Spirit of God that lives in me. And if the Spirit of God and the Word of God, the same book they had, and the same Spirit they had, and the same faith they had, is what lives in me and what I have in my hand. And if it was enough to carry those men through, it is absolutely enough to carry us through. Amen. 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 How in the world are we going to make it? Just, just fight. Put up a good fight. Amen. Fight a good fight. Over and over in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul uses the word endure. You realize when you read the four chapters of 2 Timothy that five times Paul uses the word endure in some shape, form, or fashion. In, five, in four chapters, Paul uses endurance five times. Amen. He's trying to get something across to us. It's going to take some endurance to live for Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Just some times of dogged determination that I'm not going to quit. I'm going to grab a hold of what my forefathers have passed down to me, and I am going to hold it for another generation. I want my kids to see that. Yes, sir. I want to say thank God that I have lived now long enough, Brother Fagger, that my children have got to see this. Yes, sir. And they know what something real is and not something fake. Young people, make your mind up. Make your mind up. You're going to live long enough and hold on to the truth long enough that your children will see something real and not fake. We are having our heritage stolen from us and a cheap plastic knockoff put in its place. I am telling you this. I'm, I want you all to understand something. If we live and Jesus don't come back and we live another 20 or 30 years, this stuff that has been handed down today... It is going to leave our children stranded by the wayside somewhere. Yes, and my God, God help us, y'all. Right, right. But, but the, where, where people have moved so far to the left, if our next generation moves left of where those people are, we are going to have a generation of my grandkids and great-grandkids that will be nothing more than infidels. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's predicated on us to endure. It is predicated on us to just fight. Amen. Amen. It's what y'all been looking at today. Every stop you made today was looking at either a pastor of a church or some men that they fought. Get some grit in your crawl. I, I am absolutely discouraged at, at the mamby pamby generation of Christians we are producing. <laughs> They, they, they don't say nothing about nothing. They ain't going to call nothing out. They ain't going to fight against nothing, nobody. Get, that, that is not our heritage. Our forefathers were fighters. Amen. I, I believe. Brother, you, you, even our songs. You look at our songs from, from those old generations. And we sang them. Stand up for Jesus. And, and, and things like that. It, it had a military cadence to it. It sounded militaristic. Amen. And now we got songs today that it, it sounds it sounds like sodomites wrote them. Oh my, yes, sir. There ain't nothing militaristic about it at all. It is limp-wristed, it is effeminate, and the men that preach to our people today sound limp-wristed and feministic. Yes, what happened to men? Yes, yes, Fellas, sir. we need to give us some men. Yes, God help us to be like Joab said to his brother, let's play the man for our people, for our God, and for our country. Amen. He didn't mean just acting. He meant let's do it for real. Amen. 
Let's make our mind up tonight. We're just going to fight. Every, everything that that preacher talked about today at Sandy Creek is worth fighting for. And I sat there, Brother Brian, and I listened to everything Brother Faggart said this afternoon or this morning at Sandy Creek and all those men, all those stories. And my heart broke because we are losing that. It is worth fighting for. Our young people, your young people, y'all, it's worth fighting for. It's worth living for and it's worth dying for. It's real. I say like the old preacher that he was talking about. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Preacher, how are we going to make it? We're going to make it just like they did. We're going to fight. And God's going to help us. Make your mind up. You're going to fight. And ask God to help you.